It's seen as one of China's most ambitious projects to date. Launched in 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative, also known as the New Silk Road, is a colossal investment program that aims to link economies of countries in Asia, Europe and Africa into a China-centered trading network. Until recently, the project was well on track to become the most successful cross-border investment and economic integration program. That was until the COVID-19 pandemic unleashed a global health emergency and halted its unrelenting progress. China probably needs to scale back certain of the projects. The impact of the coronavirus on China's project uh, is still unfolding. Pakistan and China are taking all relevant measures which will help time completion. COVID-19 has laid bare the frailty and vulnerability of the China-backed program worth trillions of dollars. And Pakistan is by far the most financially exposed country due to its heavy reliance on China's economic capital. What will become of China's Belt and Road Initiative across Asia and beyond? Is China's flagship program, a massive investment infrastructure financing program that involves more than 100 countries or around two-thirds of the world population. Once completed, the Belt and Road Initiative would usher in a new era of growth for economies in Asia and the rest of the world. But it wasn't until 2013 that a number of economic projects began to flourish. Roads, railways and ports are among those projects that make up China's early investments in the country. The economic corridor would start in Pakistan's mountainous north. It would then continue all the way to the town of Gwada in the south, creating a route that would splice through the country. It's a massive infrastructure network unlike anything it has ever seen before. The project is in line with Chinese President Xi Jinping's vision of creating a vast network of railways, energy pipelines, highways and border crossings linked to China and the rest of the world. These transportation networks will expand westward through the mountainous regions of former Soviet republics of Central Asia such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Central Asia is one of the key priority for China's push for the BRI because the Central Asia is a strategic located and also the resource rich region. Because Central Asia country also border with China's Xinjiang province, one of the most troubled regions in China. So uh, the primary um, uh, interest for China China, so-called China's engagement with the Central Asian countries under the BRI is strategic oriented. Yeah, so Central Asia is very important. From Central Asia, the wide transportation network will expand southward into Pakistan, India and the rest of Southeast Asia. For the past one year, China-Pakistan economic corridor has been progressing successfully and we are now moving into a new phase, focusing on industrial, agriculture and socio-economic cooperation. That will undoubtedly usher in an era of growth and prosperity while promoting innovation and new technologies so that CPAC becomes an enviable model for regional development. So for many years, Pakistan has suffered from so-called the poor and background, uh, the backwater infrastructure uh, condition. China understand, right? If you want to boost the economic growth, right, and uh, also the speed up the so-called industrialization, you need to have so-called the uh, the uh, infrastructure is ready. When the uh, infrastructure is good, 
and then the Pakistan can have the good foundation to unleash and the so-called economic potential. And from Asia, China plans to invest in port development along the Indian Ocean, all the way to East Africa and parts of Europe to help accommodate the growing maritime trade traffic. Through its land and sea corridors, China hopes to open up new markets while expanding its economic and political influence at a time when trade relations with its global competitor, the United States, are at an all-time low. So Belt Road Initiative is a Chinese alternative and a counter move to conduct its business and transaction to create an alternative for it through the land routes on which the Americans and the Westerns cannot interfere with the conducting of the Chinese uh, business relationship, mercantile relationship. In Pakistan, this assumes a very important position in the Belt Road Initiative. Perhaps Pakistan is the single most important country because every other country in the periphery of China, whether it's Vietnam or whether it's Thailand or whether it's Sri Lanka, can be easily muscled by the American influence and pressure. But Pakistan is one state that the Chinese hope and the West realizes is not easy to go down. China is facing so-called the pushback in the West, right? And also, you know, the amid the so-called the, uh, the, uh, the China and U.S. power rivalry, and also, you know, the shrinking uh, the export demand from the West. So the, uh, what I'm saying is that to create a new market, access to a new market is crucial for China's domestic industry and the manufacturing industry, right? So uh, that in, in that sense, right, that Pakistan, will be uh, served as a potential important market for the China's industry right, and the consumption market. One of the key projects that has been realized under the Belt and Road Initiative is the Gwada Port Project. Situated in the Balochistan province of Pakistan, the port is the world's deepest seaport on the Arabian Sea. The port is also regarded as strategically important to China. 60% of China's energy needs come from the Persian Gulf. To you know, build that route, and we wanted to build the transit, we wanted to be China's gateway to the world. So that vision we were talking about, and this is still one of the flagship projects, that we will have that route functioning. Gwadar will become a rival port to some of the Middle Eastern ports like Dubai and you know, various places. And that... Um, Gwadar will be a major port for Pakistan as well, and it will be uh, a port for China. Over the years, the emphasis of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, has grown from investments in road, rail and port into power generation and fibre optics. For example, eight out of the ten biggest power projects are found in Pakistan. That includes this one the Saiwal Coal Power Project in Punjab, and they fall within the CPEC. Managing Director of Pakistan's Energy Board, Mr. Shah Jahan Mirza, regards electricity as the basic engine of growth for the economy. The country's economic expansion programs, he feels, will be severely impeded if there's not enough electricity being generated to power the economy. But it can't be achieved without the injection of capital from China. One other reason for the Chinese was that because they are, they are willing to invest in a big way, because um, these are huge capital intensive projects. One, the last one which you might have seen that we have signed agreements, that is 1120 megawatt Kohala hydropower projects, and it is about $2.4 billion investment alone, one of the largest investment in any IPP in Pakistan. So gradually we started with the smaller projects. Now we, we have started going to the bigger scale, and as I said, then now we, we are reaching the 1124 megawatt, which will be the biggest hydro in the, in the private sector. So, uh, on the other hand, CPEC's motorway projects have created almost 50,000 jobs. So, this testifies that the CPEC's contribution to strengthen uh, our economic landscape has been real and substantial. Uh, the next phase of CPEC will focus on industrial innovation and agricultural and technological ad advancement. Uh, three out of nine special economic zones uh, are uh, already completed and they are open for foreign direct investment. 
It was estimated that the $62 billion CPEC projects in Pakistan would generate a revenue of 1.5 to 1.9 billion US dollars annually. That amount is expected to rise to 3.5 billion by the year 2022. Through CPEC, China could gain a route that allows for trade to move from the Arabian Sea through Pakistan and into Western China. Open up these trade routes to the Middle East, Africa and Europe will also provide economic growth to China's resource-starved Western interior and help stabilize the situation in Pakistan. We know that the Pakistan is a volatile region. They suffer from the so-called terrorist attack there, right? Because they, they believe that if that the, the China's investment can help to improve the local infrastructure, can help to boost economic growth, help can help to uh, improve the people's living standard there, right? It will help to uh, reduce the tension, help to stabilize the you know that the situation there and the create stability, right? That will be serve China's interest, right? This is the Karakoram Highway. It is also referred to as the China-Pakistan Friendship Highway. It extends 1,300 kilometers from the Chinese border to the outskirts of Islamabad. The road is China's key entry point into Pakistan. In 2010, a large earthquake rocked the region, triggering a massive landslide. It not only destroyed sections of the road, but also dammed the Hunza River, resulting in the formation of the Atabat Lake. Portions of the Karakoram Highway were submerged by the rising waters, cutting off vital links to China. The area is now popular in summer months, with tourists flocking to enjoy the cool weather and the scenery. Asif Jan operates a small boat business on Atabat Lake. The business has been running since 2011. He started it soon after the major landslide, which damaged and destroyed the road completely. The boats were the only way to transport goods and people through the region. This lake actually in 2010 was a landslide. In the downstream, there was a small town that we called Atabat. वो आतावात जो पूरा गांव वहां से एक पूरा पहाड़ सिरक गया था और ये पहले एक दरिया हुआ करता था यहां से तो वो ब्लॉक हो गया उसके बाद ये एक झील के शक्ल اختیار कर गया ये झील के शक्ल اختیار करने के इसके बैक साइड पे जो ये जहां पे मैं बैठा हूं ये शिशकट गांव है ये शिशकट गांव के ऑलमोस्ट 450 घर थे इसके जो झील है इसके नीचे ये पूरे इस झील के नीचे दब गए और ये यहां के जो लोग हैं ये बेरोजगार हो गए अपने घर बार सारा कुछ इनका खत्म हो गया था Normally, the government has damaged the damage, the house damage, the house damage, compensate kiya at a time. But in the jail, there is a lot of land that is in the jail, which is normally in the dam, which compensate for the dam. So, there is a lot of people who are in the hotel, who are in the jail, who are in the jail. So, there is an alternate jail that is the cash that is loaning. क्योंकि गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से भी कोई सपोर्ट नहीं होता तो लोगों ने इस مختلف बैंकों से सोसाइटीज से लोनिंग करके किश्तियां खरीदी थी और एक वे ऑफ इनकम बनाया था अपने लिए इन 2012 वर्क बिगन टू कंस्ट्रक्ट अ सीरीज ऑफ टनल्स एंड ब्रिजेस व्हिच वुड हेल्प रीकनेक्ट दिस वाइटल सिल्क रोड रूट विद चाइनास हेल्प ओवर अ 3 ईयर पीरियड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ चाइनीज वर्कर्स कट थ्रू द माउंटेंस टू क्रिएट अ स्लीक मॉडर्न हाईवे it's estimated that the project cost at least 275 million US dollars. You can see patches of it in Nagar and some other places. It was a very, not a very pathetic road, but a single road as our roads are. And it took us eight hours, I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, from here to Sust. But now we can do that in three hours. So the road was really very, not very good actually before this new friendship road was built. We did not start these projects before Chinese because we were lacking in finance and this is the it's big finances required to build big dams. So the Chinese stepped in as financers and we now we are on it. Because the first road condition was not good. There were different landslides, road damage, there was no road damage, there was no road damage, so the tourist flow was very low. So now, after the road repair, there is a good road, a highway made. 
جس پہ جس کی وجہ سے ٹورسٹ کی فلو جو ہے یہاں بہت ٹریپل اس سے بھی زیادہ ہو گئی ہے اور ہم لوگ اس سیزن میں زیادہ اور ایکسپیکٹ کر رہے تھے لیکن یہ کووڈ نائنٹین کی پینڈیمک کی وجہ سے جو ہے اس وقت بہت کم تھی ہے ادھر رش یہ واحد سڑک ہے جو پاکستان کو چائنا کے ساتھ ملاتی ہے یہ وہ شارٹیسٹ وے ہے چائنا کو اپنا عربین سی میں پہنچنے کے لیے یہ واحد وہی راستہ ہے یہ تو اس کی اہمیت کا تو اندازہ ہر پاکستانی لگا سکتے کہ کیا اہمیت ہے اس کی دوسرا ٹریڈ یہاں سے تو بلینس کا ٹریڈ چلتا تھا امپورٹ ایکسپورٹ کا پاکستان سے ڈرائی فروٹ اور دوسرا اینٹی کا آئٹم وغیرہ چائنا ایکسپورٹ ہوتے تھے چائنا سے ہم بہت ساری چیزیں امپورٹ کرتے تھے اسی سڑک سے from less than $2 billion in 2002 to more than $15 billion US dollars today. But both countries are hungry for more. China's ultimate goal is to cut across the country to gain access to Pakistan's deep water harbour at Gwada. Um, the Gwada port itself in Balochistan, this has been very, sig uh, it's been touted to be very significant, um, both for Pakistan and um, for China. For China, it allows China to have access to the Arabian Sea. For Pakistan, it gives it um, a, new, uh, a, new port, a new stage of port infrastructure. While the Chinese investments have been rapidly increasing, it begs the question, who will ultimately pay for these mega projects? The bigger question is, can they afford to pay for it? And what will happen if they can't? Will a country like Pakistan face the danger of falling under the so-called China's debt trap? China's new Silk Road has been touted as one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects ever conceived. One that will dramatically change the landscape of global trade. Since its launch in 2013, Chinese financial institutions have poured in hundreds of billions of dollars in loans into finance-starved countries. But seven years on, these China-funded projects have left many countries with a mountain of debt. In 2010, during the leadership of former Sri Lankan President Mahinda Rajapaksa, China established a partnership to build a series of mega projects in Hambantota on the southern coast of the country. Among others, the plan was to transform a small fishing town into a major shipping hub. The port was open amid much fanfare in 2010, but two years later, it was struggling to attract ships to berth while construction costs were rising. In the end, the projects left Colombo with 5.5 billion US dollars of debt. Unable to repay the loans, China then took over a 70% share of the deep sea port for 99 years for 1.12 billion dollars. From a beacon of hope, the Hambantota project turned out to be a huge financial burden for the Sri Lankan government. Some of the infrastructure projects that Mr. Rajapaksa undertook were done without proper planning and analysis. No proper business case was developed before the Hambantota port was uh, built. These were almost uh, individual decisions of the Rajapaksas to spend that money. And it's coming to billions of dollars. Some of the money we borrowed at very high rates uh, but bulk of it, we have borrowed at what are called quasi-commercial or just about concessionary uh, rates around 2 to 2.5 percent uh, as opposed to some of the loans at 6.3 percent. That's not correct because uh, the uh, transactions were viable. They made financial sense. But uh, what happened was during the election campaign in 2015, the United National Party uh, said that they would uh, do away with all these projects. Mm? They viciously attacked China. We questioned the deals that were done in regard to the Hambantota Harbour and the airport. We felt that we were the losers in the deal. 
in regard to Hambantota and um, the airport, we told the Chinese, the companies and the governments, we are not in a position to honor this agreement, which is flawed. And finally, we came to an agreement that we would have public-private partnerships. The Chinese government made a request. We give the first options to Chinese companies. In the case of the harbor, China merchant was a good offer. We accepted it. Another country that was in dire need of capital is Pakistan. The country has been facing a serious economic and financial crisis. It borrowed huge sums of money from China, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and the IMF. Exports have stagnated. Its economy has been in shambles for decades. The Pakistani currency, the rupee, has faltered. It has depreciated by 7.3% to the US dollar, while foreign reserves stood at 13.2 billion US dollars, just enough to cover three and a half months of imports. For 60 years, Pakistan accumulated roughly 40 billion dollars of debt. And in the last 10 years, we accumulated 55 billion dollars of reserve of debt. And the, from 2013 to 2018, the previous regime, we accumulated 35 billion dollars of debt. So you can see that how recklessly the country borrowed and it in, in drowned the country under debt. Every time, whenever we face problem, instead of taking that as a challenge and addressing that is issues with the homemade, uh, homegrown uh, 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 reform program and policies, we just go to the IMF. We get resources and we relax. And then once the IMF program is over, after two years or one year, we come back to the same problem. Because we are not addressing the problem. So IMF, going to the IMF is a temporary solution. Just in July last year, the IMF approved a $6 billion loan to Pakistan to help resuscitate its ailing economy. In recent years, when loans from the IMF and the World Bank had dried up, Pakistan turned to its old ally, China, for much needed investments to help prop up the economy. Pakistan certainly has worries about debt, um, not, just to, uh, not just to China, but to, um, to a number of other countries as well. But it's estimated, and, and you know, and I'm, I'm always, um, I always quote figures with somewhat, uh, with some trepidation when it comes to CPAC issues, because we go on estimates. We don't, have, in many cases, we don't have official uh, numbers on, on this issue itself. But estimates are that uh, Pakistan's uh, external debt, one fifth of it uh, is to China. Um, and last year on account of CPAC as well. So it is, it is a very real issue. Given the amount of debt that Pakistan has with China, there's a real danger that Pakistan may fall under the China's debt trap. It now has $60 billion in loans for the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. Still, there are many Pakistanis who reject the view that the Belt and Road Initiative is a debt trap. The Saiwal coal power plant started operations in July 2017. It's able to generate 1,320 megawatts of power. This is one of 20 completed power projects under the CPEC banner. Managing Director of Pakistan's Private Power and Infrastructure Board, Shah Jahan Mirza, for one, only has positive things to say about China's active participation in Pakistan's overall development. China, they are basically the trusted and tried uh, friend and, and brother, so they have helped us all. And the, as I said earlier, the Chinese, um, Chinese companies and Chinese government have worked tremendously hard. They have set actually the world, world record in completion of these projects. The Saiwal power project was completed in 28 months. This is the world record for a 2 into 660 megawatt power project to be completed. Similarly, Port Qasem coal power project was also 
also completed in a record time. I think it's, it's been a bit exaggerated fear that it's going to be, uh, have a huge burden on, on, on Pakistan. Um, if you look at the CPACs contribute only the 6 or 7 percent of the, the debt on Pakistan. Rest is we owed by the IMF and other international uh, financial institutions, even uh, the bilateral arrangement we have for many of the Middle Eastern nations. So this is not going to have impact and even this is long term loans. And for the economy, what one thing we have to be to be understand when the CPAC was came, Pakistan economy was under stress, and Pakistan political profile in international uh, context uh, was also uh, facing a lot of challenges. Uh, and CPAC somehow has not only the the, the boost the the confidence of the investor, local confidence, uh, uh, confidence of local investor here. Yeah also attracted the, uh, the foreign investments here in the country and also uh, Pakistan also came again in the, uh, in the political arena uh, in, in a way. Pakistan is betting that once its economy grows it would be able to repay the BRI loans. A sufficient and stable power supply is a key factor in this equation. When we build the dam we generate electricity, then we sell electricity, so we, we cover the revenue. And it is our expectation that, as I said earlier, that as these projects uh, uh, repay their loan and initial investment, the tariff will be lower. There have been a lot of discussion about uh, the debt issue, um, which in case of, uh, like, you know, China-Pakistan economic corridor is quite uh, displaced. Uh, the public debt relating to CPEC projects in Pakistan is less than 10% of our total debt. And furthermore, this debt is, uh, has been obtained from China um, and has a maturity period of 20 years. And the interest rate is only 2.34%. So if grants are included, the interest value slides down to only 2%. So uh, Pakistan takes uh, you know, its financial obligations very, very uh, seriously. Pakistan's already fragile economy had only just been moving towards stability. And the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is regarded as the harbinger of the much-awaited economic prosperity for the country. It, however, still has a long way to go to become a successful economy. But to make matters worse, a health crisis struck. The COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a severe blow to the country's ability to generate sufficient revenue and service its debts. Will the pandemic's economic fallout considerably derail the country's recovery process and adversely disrupt its China-Pakistan economic corridor projects? The coronavirus outbreak has hit the global economy much harder than expected. It has severely disrupted and slowed global commerce to a crawl. The COVID-19 pandemic has also pushed China's economy to the brink. GDP for the first three months of the year fell 6.8%. Although it's expected to post a positive growth of over 1% this year, following its success in combating the pandemic, it's a dramatic drop from the 6.1% growth it achieved the year before. It has also been reported that some 460,000 Chinese firms have shut down operations permanently in the first quarter of the year due to the mounting economic stress. So the world economy has taken a big hit and some of the unfortunate trends in the global economy, uh, the growing protectionism, uh, the geopolitical <clears throat> tensions between the US and China, these clearly have been uh, deepened by the pandemic. And that I think is going to create problems for the world economy as well as for China. 
and that will also include projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. According to China's Economic Affairs Department, up to 20% of these projects have now been scaled back because of the pandemic. It has also caused tremendous difficulties for BRI participating nations to meet their debt obligations. The BRI was facing some headwinds uh, even before the pandemic. Um, there were question marks about um, the rising debt levels that some countries were uh, burdened by. There were question marks about the viability of pro uh, the projects and the way it was funded um, and the speed with which everything was being done so fast together that it was leading to problems like current account imbalances in some countries like Pakistan. The impact of the coronavirus pandemic on Pakistan has also been equally severe. The country has over 285,000 infections and more than 6,000 fatalities. GDP growth has also fallen. It currently stands at 0.98% compared to 5.8% when Prime Minister Imran Khan first took power two years ago. And that impact has also been keenly felt by 61-year-old fruit seller Shirula Baik. Shirula hails from the Hunza Valley. The mountainous valley is popular among tourists because of its serene landscape and natural beauty. It also lies along the new Silk Road. But it's all quiet around this time of the year since the pandemic began to wreak havoc around the globe. And that has severely affected his business. <laughs> The same story of economic hardship is also being shared by scores of other farmers in Pakistan who rely on the sale of their crops to sustain their livelihood. Many, like 28-year-old farmer Gulam Hussein, feels that the pandemic has only caused problems and misery for him and his family. We are also local farmers in the market. There is a lot of disturbance from the corona. There is a border also closed. There is a rush in the market. There is a lot of stock in the market. And now there is no profit. At this time, there are a lot of problems from the corona. And when the market is open, because our tomatoes and peas are in the market. Now, there is a lot of problems from the corona. There is a lot of problems from the corona. There are a lot of problems from the corona. So, a lot of farmers, our farmers, we ourselves, so we are not stuck in the market, we are not stuck in the market. Adding to the misery, the inflation rate has soared. It has increased to 9.3% in July this year, from 4.45% the year before. With Pakistan's economy shrinking, unemployment is also rising. According to a recent survey by Golub, the jobless rate is expected to hit 6.65 million compared to 5.8 million in the last financial year. And all these developments will pose a negative impact on Pakistan's financial standing and its ability to meet its debt obligations. As of March this year, its external debt stood at around 112 billion US dollars. It's another bump in the road of many um, long-drawn uh, starts and stops, starts and stops. Now, Pakistan's economy is taking a beating, which economy isn't at the moment. But um, given the backdrop that Pakistan finds itself in terms of its current account deficit, this is, this is uh, particularly harsh for Pakistan at the moment. And on the other hand, Pakistan doesn't want to go down, with too, um, go down the route of taking more loans. 
because there's a debt crisis that, that it's looming as well. In April this year, the government asked for a debt relief of its $30 billion of loans to China for its CPEC projects. The approval to its request will give Pakistan breathing room to meet its loan commitments. But will Pakistan run the risk of falling into the so-called China debt trap if these loan commitments are not met? We don't have a growth strategy. The biggest problem is we don't have a growth strategy. As you well know, if your income is growing, then your debt will be manageable. The rule for managing your debt is that your income must grow faster than your debt. Then you can service your debt. But here, unfortunately, our income is not growing. That's because we don't have a growth strategy of our own, because we've not figured out uh, how to get growth. We need to put this in context. There have certainly been <clears throat> some cases where um, the debt issue became really a, a big problem. And you know, a lot of people talk about uh, Sri Lanka and Hambantota and so on. Um, and again, there, I think there's been a learning. And uh, uh, apart from those, uh, issue, those, those particular incidents, I don't think there's been a, a huge um, issue about a debt trap. Um, nevertheless, I think it is important for China and the recipient countries to uh, look at the sequencing of these projects so that you don't get a bunching together of these projects, which then means that you take on uh, debt and financing loads in a very short uh, period of uh, time. That can be destabilizing. But overall, I don't think the debt trap issue is as, uh, uh, as negative as it has been made out to be. Still, some observers agree that the COVID-19 pandemic has hit China's economy hard. But so too are its cash-strapped allies. Many beneficiaries of the Belt and Road Initiative in Asia and Africa are now feeling the impact of the pandemic on their economies. And that has affected the ability of these debtor nations to repay loans from China. Obviously, a lot of these countries have a genuine problem with debt repayment and they do need debt relief. And I think in some cases, the debt taken on was actually not sustainable. China has made some of this commitment. We will temporarily uh, suspend the debt payment for the 77 countries. We don't know the detail, but I think that's a good gesture. But in the long term, if all the countries are along the Belt and Road, especially for the poor and underdeveloped countries, if they all ask for the debt relief, it will cause huge debt burden. Uh, for China. So China has nearly to make so-called uh, strike a right balance. China has extended massive loans worth billions of dollars to many participating nations under the Belt and Road Initiative. And that includes fragile states which have little chance of meeting their debt obligations. And it's now under great pressure to provide debt relief or even write them off during the current tough economic environment. Will the pandemic force a major rethink of the Belt and Road projects? Will they survive the challenges in the post-pandemic world? Life has gone from bad to worse for 41-year-old cherry farmer Hussein Ali. Since the pandemic began, he's not been able to attract crowds to buy his produce in the open market because of the major movement and travel restrictions. The buying power of the locals have also been significantly reduced. Tourists who used to visit his fruit store are almost non-existent, and that has made it much harder for him to earn a living. Khaskar jo transportation hai wo mehangi ho gayi hai aur logon ka access kam ho gaya hai market tak to ye tamam cheezon ko agar dekhe to taqriban na hone ke barabar hai is waqt to is waqt farmer to bahut pareshan hai aur khususan government ka bhi is hawale se abhi tak koi aisa strategy bhi nahi banayi hai ki farmer kis tarah apne jo na losses ko is waqt pura kare तो ये तमाम चीजों का अगर देखा जाए तो हम मतलब जो फार्मर है वो काफी परेशान है क्यों या फिर उसकी जो ना आप बाज फार्मर जो अपने जो ना वो लेबर भी रखे हुए तो उन्होंने सबको फारिग कर दिया क्योंकि इस वक्त वो बिजनेस नहीं है और आप देखेंगे कि भाई 
جو چیریز ہیں وہ اس وقت درختوں کے اوپر ہی خراب ہو کے وہ ختم ہو رہے ہیں جیسے جو نہ پرندہ کھا رہے یا اور ڈیمیجز ہو رہے ہیں تو وہ نہ ہونے کے برابر ہے اور اس سے کافی جو نا کووڈ کی وجہ سے بہت لاسز کا جو نا سامنا کرنا پڑا اس وقت Clearly, the pandemic has dealt a severe blow to Pakistan's economy. Exports are down. Many orders have also been cancelled. The pandemic has affected businesses across a variety of industries. That was also what happened to Mahmoud Ahmad. Mahmoud runs a manufacturing business in Lahore. Among others, his company manufactures all types of hospital furniture equipment including beds and side tables. Business was humming along smoothly until the pandemic hit. That has ruined everything he has built over many years. بس یہی ہے ہماری گورنمنٹ کو بس یہ پیغام ہے کہ وہ اچھے طریقے سے اپنا کام جو ہے نا وہ سر انجام دیں اور جو پروجیکٹ پہلے سے ہمارے ملک میں چل رہے تھے ان کو پورا کریں انشاءاللہ وہ پروجیکٹ پورا کریں گے تو ہمارے ملک میں ترقی ہوگی However he's fortunate that he can still rely on demand from local hospitals to help make up for his losses کرونا کی وجہ سے ہم ملک کی خدمت کر رہے ہیں جو ہسپتالوں میں کچھ سامان چاہیے ان کو ہم پرووائڈ کر رہے ہیں باقی جو ہے دوسرے بزنس ہو وہ کافی جو ہے نا کرونا کی وجہ سے ڈسٹرب ہیں The reality is the lack of demand and the disruptions to economic activities have greatly affected the government's ability to generate revenue International trade has been severely affected In May this year Exports fell by more than 50% to below 1 billion US dollars. Imports have also dropped significantly. It will have a significant dent in the sense that Pakistan's economic problem is primarily linked to the lack of exports from Pakistan. So it has a current account deficit. So it needs to increase its revenue generation within, but it also needs to increase the amounts of exports. from Pakistan. So in that sense, it's going to hit Pakistan in that way. But then one could ask that if there's, um, if there's an economic slowdown, then is this export trade actually going to take off itself? While some believe that the current economic slump would force a major rethink of China's Belt and Road Initiative, Pakistan is bucking the trend. The Pakistani government has recently approved, among others, a project to upgrade its railway lines worth some $6.8 billion as part of the multi-billion dollar China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, or CPEC. Pakistan and China actually inked a $11 billion deal to develop further projects. And what is significant, and I, I bring this up here because what is significant that in this $11 billion deal for new projects, two of the projects that are included are dams that are going to be built in what is known as Pakistan occupied Kashmir itself, which um, highlights not only the economic and infrastructural needs of Pakistan, but also geopolitical concerns that are interspersed in CPAC itself. Other important thing about CPAC is for the Chinese, it is the poster child of the BRI project. So they are willing to pump in more money to, to demonstrate to other countries apart from Pakistan that China stands with them at, at this point of time. We don't have any such worry. Uh, both Pakistan and China are firmly committed uh, to the timely completion of the project. Pakistan has completed 19 projects under CPEC, while 28 are under implementation, and another 41 are in the pipeline. The primary motivation uh, driven China's uh, push for the BRI is not just about the economic consideration, also the strategic consideration. So China plan for the, you know, gain the, seeking to gain the long-term strategic uh, benefit, right? Benefit, that's long-term, right? So China never care about so-called the short-term, the economy or the, you know, the commercial, uh, the benefit or either now is a loss or, you know, make profit, right? So China plan for the long-term. To Shah Jahan especially, 
In spite of China's long-term economic and strategic goals, he sees China as a friend who helps Pakistan during its hour of need and help the country achieve its economic vision. The project was also completed in a record time. So that's where I would say that the Chinese, Chinese has helped Pakistan, looking at the, the scenario of huge and long, long load shedding. So they have created this kind of examples. And uh, the other thing which I have seen in the Chinese companies only, probably there will be very few examples in the world, that the Chinese companies have started construction before achieving financial close for these projects. In the eye of the China, uh, the Pakistan is a great friend, is a most trusted uh, airline, right? So I think that the, to the Pakistani side, right, many Pakistani, right, they view uh, China is also the most trusted airline. And also they view, right, the CPAC, uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, will be a game changer for Pakistan. There's no doubt that the pandemic has weakened China's economy and brought disruptions to its manufacturing as well as supply chain activities. It has also forced China to cut spending on many of its overseas projects. In other words, the pandemic has hurt China's dream. But President Xi Jinping is not about to abandon his dream of building the new Silk Road that connects China and the world. The Belt and Road Initiative is the pet project of President Xi Jinping as part of China's strategy to achieve its economic and political aspirations abroad. It's a massive but ambitious project that's considered a roadmap to achieving the China dream. It also clearly signaled that China remains open for business, its capital account, for instance, but in a gradual manner. And it seemed to show a, an understanding that China just couldn't be, uh, you know, go back to being inward looking like in the past. So I think it's a balanced uh, review uh, of uh, Chinese strategy coming out of this. It's a mega connectivity project that is going to change the destiny of more than 3 billion people. In, in South Asia, in Central Asia, and in Africa alone. So all these countries where this, this BRI project is uh, scheduled to pass through, all these countries are committed and they have opened their doors. And uh, uh, the projects are being uh, uh, built, constructed, and implemented. Despite the external, both the external and internal challenges, China is determined to push for the BRI because this serves uh, China's long-term interests, right? Because you know that power rivalry and also you know the changing uh, geopolitical environment, uh, as well as you know that the impact of the COVID-19, the pandemic on the global economy. I think that from the Chinese perspective, the BRI will be so even more important to accommodate China, the rise of China, and also that uh, engagement with the world.